Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to a Monday Watchman Newscast live stream. We've got a lot going on right now in the world's most chaotic and volatile region, the Middle East, that we're going to break down how it affects you no matter where you live. Let's start with Hezbollah. We'll get to Hamas and the latest with the Gaza war, but up north, folks, that is the region, that is the area that we have really been watching. Up north, you might say, what's that? I mean to the north of Israel, in particular southern Lebanon, which is Hezbollah's main power base. Now, earlier today, Hezbollah, presumably along with Hamas and other Palestinian jihadist factions in southern Lebanon, launched a barrage of 30 rockets in the span of one hour into northern Israel. Now, Israel responded. This was the largest barrage, by the way, since October 7th, since Israel's war with Hamas broke out. But as we watched the northern front, again, the largest barrage, and to my mind, a major escalation to the north. Now, key point here, Hamas, which, yes, also has a presence in southern Lebanon. They operate under the watchful eye of Hezbollah, which rules southern Lebanon along the Israel border with an iron fist. Hamas said it launched 16 of those rockets, and presumably Hezbollah launched the rest. Whatever the case, Israel responded directly targeting Hezbollah. And why wouldn't they? Again, if Hamas is operating in southern Lebanon, it's with the full approval and under the watchful approving eye of Hezbollah. So Israel went straight to the source, carried out airstrikes and shelling against Hezbollah infrastructure. Here's a few more facts uh, from the Times of Israel about what went down. 30 rockets in one hour, folks, is no joke for sure. Uh, to the north, where Hezbollah obviously has this powerful arsenal of some 150,000 rockets and missiles pointed at every inch of Israel. But the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, after the rocket launches, their fighter jets struck Hezbollah targets in Lebanon, including a site housing, quote, technological assets, a weapons depot, rocket launch positions belonging to Hezbollah, and other infrastructure. Now, why is this so important? Well, it comes on the heels of what was a pretty major event that we reported on on Friday's newscast. And by the way, if you miss any of our live streams here on the channel, just be sure to go to our archives on the homepage. Under newscast, they're all right there. And while you're there, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted so you will never miss a Watchman newscast if you are subscribed. We love to have you with us here every day as Watchmen and women on the wall for such a time as this, Bible times, prophetic times. But on Friday, we discussed the speech, the much-anticipated, much ballyhooed speech given by none other than terror master Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah. Now, during that much-anticipated speech, uh, Nasrallah pretty much uh, engaged in the typical rhetoric, threats against the United States, threats against Israel. It was overall, folks, I have to say, kind of a dud, uh, considering all the anticipation that built up around it. But I think that's actually a good thing that it was a dud, so to speak, because a lot of people were saying, look, Nasrallah may very well declare war against Israel during this speech. That didn't happen. As a matter of fact, I don't want to say far from it, but what was interesting to me about Nasrallah's speech on Friday and linking it back to the rocket barrage today, 30 again out of southern Lebanon, was that Nasrallah said, look, everything that happened in Gaza, that was completely Hamas. That was Hamas's planning and Hamas acting by its own volition. We applaud it. Nasrallah said. We, we thought it was one of the greatest days in history, but it wasn't us. It was strictly Hamas. Now, two lines of thinking here as to why Nasrallah, to a degree, distanced himself and distanced Hezbollah a bit from October 7th. Uh, number one, the most obvious reason, because he knows Israel may very well unleash hell against him next. Uh, but number two, and our friend Amir Sarfati shared this here on, the, on a live stream about two weeks ago. Again, in our archives, you can find them all under newscast. But Amir, who has a great channel here on YouTube called Behold Israel that we encourage you to subscribe to as well, he said, look, Eric, from what I'm hearing, Hamas may have acted too quickly, meaning Iran's plan was to activate that entire ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides. Hamas, you, you know the players. If you watch us on a regular basis, Hamas 
and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. You've got Hezbollah, of course, in Lebanon, the Shia militias in Syria and Iraq, and then the Houthis in Yemen, who've been very active in recent days as well. Iran's plan was to activate the entire ring of fire, not just the Gaza ring, which was deadly enough, as we saw, some 1,400 Israelis, mostly civilians, slaughtered in cold blood. Imagine if Gaza and southern Lebanon ignited, and even Syria, ignited at the same time. We had an invasion, folks, a literal Hamas invasion of southern Israel on October 7th, nearly one month ago to the day, hard to believe. But imagine if simultaneously Hezbollah invaded from the north and breached the security fences there and flooded into the communities of northern Israel. Imagine if Syria, if jihadis crossed over from the Golan Heights into Israeli communities close to the border there, concurrently, all while the Houthis and others and all these groups are bombarding Israel with rockets and missiles, it would have made it would have been several magnitudes, many, many magnitudes more horrific, if that's possible, than October 7th, even. I spoke to an Israeli friend last night who said October 7th was perhaps the blackest day in the history of the modern state of Israel. No doubt. Israel's 9-11. Israel's Pearl Harbor. But he said it could have been worse. He said, in a sense, we we dodged a bullet to the north and in other places because Hamas, according to some reports, and Amir Sarfati uh, laid this out uh, on the newscast, as I mentioned recently, Hamas may have acted too soon. They did not wait for the entire ring of fire. Basically, they went off and acted on their own. They didn't act according to the ultimate plan of the Iranian regime. Interesting. Now, Hamas apparently had originally planned this attack, the carnage of October 7th, we're now learning through interrogations of Hamas terrorists by the IDF and Israeli security services. Hamas originally planned this attack for Passover, apparently. So it would have been a spring attack, but they waited for whatever reason. We're not quite sure. Uh, they waited at, at Iran's behest, by the way. And folks, key point we want to hit on, hit on, and we've been hitting on this on the newscast, that the Iranian regime is the head of the snake. And October 7th, listen very closely, would have never happened without the Iranian regime, period. So Iran was pulling the strings here. We know that there were meetings between uh, Iranian and Hamas officials in the run-up to October 7th. We know that Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists trained in Iran in September in the weeks prior to October 7th. And oh, by the way, as we reported here in the newscast many times, there were frequent meetings in Beirut, Lebanon, between Iranian, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad officials, you guessed it, in the weeks leading up to October 7th. But I'm sure the Iranian regime had nothing to do with October 7th. Folks, come on. We have an audience here that is very educated, who are on top of things, and if you watch us on a regular basis, you know that the Iranian regime is the head of the snake when it comes to terror in the region. Some 90% of Hamas's funding comes from Iran. Uh, practically 100% of Hezbollah's funding comes from Iran. So you do the math. But that brings us to today. We talked about the Northern Front and Nasrallah bringing it full circle here. And welcome to everyone who's watching from around the world. I'm, I'm not in the usual studio today. As you can see, I'm on the road, but welcome everyone if you're joining us right now. It's great to have you with us from the four corners of the earth here on a Monday afternoon in November. But what's the big takeaway of Nasrallah's speech? And by the way, we've got thousands with us. We'll have thousands more by the time we are done. But what's the big takeaway? We had Nasrallah's speech where he basically said, we are going to escalate things. He didn't declare war. He didn't lay down the gauntlet in, in, in a major tangible way, but he did say, look, we're going to escalate. And Israel, the more you tighten the vies uh, around Hamas in Gaza and move towards eliminating Hamas, and more on that in a minute, uh, then we're going to up our attacks. Is today, folks, I ask, what do you think? I want to hear what you think. Was this Hezbollah? upping the ante, so to speak. And look, a barrage of 30 rockets in one hour is no joke. 
And it comes on the heels of Nasrallah's speech, which, as I mentioned, was a bit of a disappointment to jihadis in the region in many ways, to the point where a Hamas official said, and we talked about this on Friday, a Hamas official said, look, uh, this was not enough, essentially. He said, the words are great, the rhetoric's great, but we want more action from Hezbollah. And I believe, folks, that when Hamas acted on October 7th and carried out this demonic massacre, I believe that Hamas expected Hezbollah to go all in right away and that they miscalculated. And Hezbollah thus far has, I don't want to say it's pulled its punches because look, uh, Israeli soldiers have been killed in these engagements with Hezbollah along the border over the past four weeks. At least 11, I believe, and over 50 Hezbollah fighters have been killed by the Israel Defense Forces in these daily, and I mean daily, engagements. So it's not that Hezbollah has completely pulled its punches, but as I mentioned a minute ago, folks, look, Hezbollah, a much more powerful and advanced and well-trained fighting force than Hamas. Do the math again, right? Some 150,000 rockets and missiles pointed at every inch of the world's one and only Jewish state, including also at least 40 to 50,000 well-trained, battle-hardened foot soldiers. Hezbollah is a different beast, and I do mean beast, than Hamas, and we saw the damage Hamas did on October 7th. Uh, picture that and multiply that by several times. If that is what you have in the form of Hezbollah, which begs the question, before we move on to the U.S., sending a nuclear submarine to the Middle East, and before we give you a quick Gaza update, does this northern front, we've been asking this for four weeks now, does Nasrallah feel the pressure to activate that northern front? I think there's two ways it goes here, right? And we've laid this out in previous weeks. Either Hezbollah and, by extension, its Iranian master, because, look, Hezbollah is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Iranian regime. Do Hezbollah, this is the big question of the war, folks, to my mind, one of the big questions, at least, do Hezbollah and the Iranian regime step back and watch as their brother in arms, their terror ally, Hamas, is wiped off the face of the earth by the Israel Defense Forces? Hamas has been a very valuable asset to Iran, to Hezbollah, to the jihadist cause. Does Iran Do Iran and Hezbollah just let that fall by the wayside and lose that crucial tool in their jihadi terror toolbox and allow Hamas and most likely Islamic Jihad to be eliminated in Gaza? Do they allow Israel to pacify Gaza? Or do they say two things. Number one, Hamas is too valuable to our cause uh, to just slip away. We can't let Hamas just go by the wayside. We need to bail them out. And secondly, do they say, we're looking weak. I mean, uh, we, we've talked a big game, Iran and Hezbollah, but now we're just allowing Hamas to be destroyed by the hated Zionist entity. Considering that, do they jump in? Here's the other point here before we move on. Does Israel act preemptively? Folks, look, I think Israel really ultimately has no choice. The day of reckoning is coming between Israel and Hezbollah. I've called it the Great Northern War here in the newscast, where Israel will be forced eventually, it might be sooner rather than later, to face off against Hezbollah and the Iranian regime in Lebanon and in Syria. What about the timing right now? Look, Israel has called up over 300,000 reserve soldiers. Israel's on war footing right now. Uh, they're on the front lines in Gaza. People are up north. Consider that. Uh, or does the reserves all go home, only to be called up again for the eventual war in Lebanon? I'm not so sure. Secondly, key point to consider, yes, the southern communities have been evacuated. Uh, it's horrific. People have been displaced, obviously, along the Gaza border. There's beautiful Israeli communities there. But what about the communities in the north? Over 30 Israeli communities in the north along the Lebanon border, which, by the way, is also beautiful, mountainous, a scenic region, God's handiwork there, and yet you have Hezbollah lurking in homes there and in private businesses there with rockets aimed at Israel. Nonetheless, what would you do if you were an Israeli living along the Lebanon border? And again, they've been evacuated. They've been displaced, hundreds of thousands of Israelis. Would you go back? I want to hear your thoughts on this. Would you go back and live along the Lebanon border if Hezbollah was still there? Or would the memory of October 7th be fresh in your mind? If you're living in northern Israel, will you say, hey, we saw what Hamas did down south. 
along the Gaza border. And Hezbollah is much more powerful than Hamas. Would you feel very, very uneasy living along the border uh, of Lebanon? If you if you live in northern Israel, uneasy unless unless Hezbollah was dealt with and defeated. Then you go back. But if Hezbollah still lurking there on the border, poised to strike and duplicate October 7th, to, in their desire at least, to, to an even worse magnitude, I'm not so sure those Israelis who live in the north go back until Hezbollah is dealt with. So Israel has some very tough decisions to make, which brings us to the United States. Now, there are there is chatter, I should say, that the U.S. has laid down the gauntlet and warned uh, Iran and Hezbollah to not get involved in this war. Again, two carrier groups uh, are in the Mediterranean right now along Israel's coast. We know that. Secondly, as I reported at the top, the U.S. has sent a nuclear submarine to the Middle East. Again, the goal of this, in addition to the carrier groups, the nuclear sub, is to deter Iran and Hezbollah from getting involved in this war. So far, it appears that the deterrence has worked, I think. But ultimately, when the rubber hits the road, do Iran and Hezbollah really believe that Israel, or I'm sorry, the U.S. is going to get involved? Do they believe there's teeth behind the U.S. sending a nuclear submarine and sending those carrier groups to the region? Do they believe Biden will really act? Or do they believe it's all for show? And it, it may deter in the short term, but eventually... Do Iran and Hezbollah probe and test? They say, okay, you're sending carrier groups and you are sending nuclear submarines, but let's see if there's, again, any teeth behind these shows of force by the United States. And another thing to keep in mind here, a crucial point, which I believe may make the Iranian regime uh, deduce that the U.S. does not have true intentions of actually using uh, the assets it's sending to the region. Listen, folks, there have been some 31 terror attacks carried out by Iran-backed militias in the past three weeks alone. Two weeks, I'm sorry. 31 attacks against U.S. assets in Iraq and Syria, U.S. soldiers, U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria in the past two weeks alone. And the U.S. response so far were those, we reported here last week, those limited airstrikes along the Iraq-Syria border but clearly the message was not sent and the memo was not received by the Iranian regime because they continue to launch attacks. Again, 31 in the past two weeks, including after those U.S. airstrikes. So Iran is pushing forward and they're continuing to test and to probe. And they're saying, look, OK, we can weather the, we can weather the storm when it comes to these airstrikes. We can weather that storm. They have made that calculation. They're saying, look, the U.S. is going to bomb some empty weapons depots and some storage facilities. We can weather that storm. We will consider to continue to send our militias uh, to strike in Iraq and Syria. And folks, what if, and look, we've seen U.S. contractors and U.S. soldiers killed by these Iranian-backed strikes over the past few years. But God forbid, if one of these attacks is truly devil, uh, deadly and truly successful, then how does the U.S. react? And U.S. officials were quoted anonymously in, in the Wall Street Journal this weekend. No matter what you think of the Wall Street Journal, I'm just telling you what they said. They said, look, it's we." they said we've been lucky. Quote, that's what they're saying, we've been lucky. They said it's not for lack of effort, uh, meaning Iran wants to kill Americans in the region. So are things going to come to a head there? Are Hezbollah and Iran deterred? Deterred for now, but deterred for the long haul from getting into the fray here. And what does the U.S. do? Does the U.S. strike Hezbollah? Does the U.S. Uh, shoot down Hezbollah rockets and missiles? It's possible. We did see a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea shoot down Houthi rockets and missiles just last weekend. So it's possible. Hey, we might wrap a little bit early today, but before we go, a quick point here that tomorrow night, We've got a special I really want you to tune into on TBN, 8 p.m. Eastern time. It is called Heroes of the Faith. Now, we've been talking a bunch about the rise of anti-Semitism around the world. But right now, Christian persecution is also at unprecedented levels. And 
this special Heroes of the Faith that I'm hosting, again, 8 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night, chronicles the history of Christian martyrdom from the time of Jesus to today. We believe it's a powerful program for such a time as this, and we strongly encourage you to tune in tomorrow night. That's Tuesday, gosh, November 7th already, hard to believe, at 8 p.m. Eastern time, Heroes of the Faith. I think we have a trailer here to check out. Uh, Daniel, can we take a look real quick at the teaser? Welcome to a TBN special featuring some of the greatest unsung heroes of the Christian faith. Tyndale had completed translating almost the entire Bible when the government at the time decided that they weren't going to have it, and so they arrested him. Jesus wasn't a powerless victim. He was a powerful sacrifice, and they went to their graves believing that. This is the true story of men and women whose sacrifice resounds throughout the ages and into the very halls of heaven. Folks, again, that's 8 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night, Tuesday, November 7th, Heroes of the Faith. I'm excited for you to watch this show and to spread the word about if you're a Christian like I am. And look, we have non-Christian viewers watching as well, but this matters to everyone, I believe. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus like myself, are laying down their lives quite literally. We have a very comfortable here in the United States where I'm sitting for now, but around the world, Believers are laying down their lives, paying the ultimate price to follow Jesus. Ultimately, these are inspiring and encouraging stories, folks. So we strongly encourage you to tune in tomorrow night. Okay, a Gaza update real quick. I did. We're running out of time. I did want to talk about Russia and Libya. Just a quick note here how Russia is getting more involved in Libya, more uh, more cooperation with the military in Libya, terror forces there. And the prophetic implications of that, we'll move that to tomorrow, but a quick mention about Gaza. The IDF now essentially has entirely circled Gaza City. And the big takeaway here are the tunnels. Now, Israel said overnight some airstrikes were carried out that severely hampered and affected those Hamas tunnels and caved a bunch of them in. Again, as we reported here last week, there are some 300 miles of these Hamas tunnels, a virtual subterranean city beneath Gaza City, and at least 1,500 of these terror tunnels. And the problem here, folks, is that presumably the hostages, some 240 that Hamas hauled off into the bowels of hell beneath Gaza City, are being held in those tunnels right now. Uh, that is the presumption by the IDF, and I believe it's an accurate one. So that complicates matters. And of course, Hamas, look, the way they operate, they pop out of the hatches, essentially, these tunnels. They'll fire a, a rocket-propelled uh, grenade at IDF forces, and they'll scurry back into the tunnel and scurry out. So it, it's fierce hand-to-hand, -hand, close quarters, guerrilla warfare. Uh, and in that kind of warfare, there are casualties. So it's a tough go right now for the IDF, but they're saying, hey, we're making great progress. We've eliminated several top Hamas commanders just in recent days. And again, they believe they really made a dent in those tunnels. But Gaza City, one to watch here before we go. We've mentioned this on previous newscast. Al-Shifa Hospital, Al-Shifa Hospital, Hamas's infrastructure, infrastructure command and control center beneath that hospital, including perhaps some top Hamas leaders, Hamas intentionally positions their headquarters beneath a civilian target, a hospital. How does Israel get around that and neutralize the Hamas threat beneath that hospital? Pray for the IDF right now, folks, uh, for wisdom, for protection, for discernment. By the way, uh, pray for innocent civilians in Israel, too, who are still being bombarded by rockets, as I reported earlier. And pray for Palestinians in Gaza who are being used as human shields by Hamas, who have no regard for human life. These are demonic Nazis and barbarians. I do not say that lightly. Lastly, pray for the hostages for a miraculous God-ordained rescue that they come home safely to their families. Hey, thanks so much for joining us here today on the live stream. Until tomorrow's live stream, reminder, Heroes of the Faith tomorrow night. In the meantime, back here tomorrow with a new live stream. God bless you, and remember, never hold your peace. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching.